How long will humans be able to live in the future? And what's a good alternative to collagen if you can't take it? These are some of the topics we're going to cover in this Q&A episode. If you want to ask me a question in the future, then make sure you follow me on Instagram at Seamlund. It's showtime. All right. The first question is until what age do you think we'll be able to live with all the new technologies and information? So that's a very interesting question. I'm actually researching my next book or actually I'm already in the process of writing my next book that is focused around longevity and life extension. And this is something that I've been yeah just looking at researching over the last few weeks and months. So what I've come to the conclusion right now is that there is, let's say, obviously, the certain uh, current estimated biological limit for human life ex- lifespan, which is around 120 years. The oldest living person in history was John Clement from France. She lived until the age of 122, which is the you know greatest, longest uh, living human in history. The second place is a Japanese woman, and she lived until 119 years. So there's actually a pretty wide gap between John Clement, who lived un- until 122, and the second longest living person, and the third longest living person is also 119 years. So there's a three year gap between those things. And because of this reason, many people who were like investigating John Clement's actual like verified ages and stuff like that, they they came up with this theory that it wasn't actually John Clement who lived until 122. John Clement was maybe thought to die actually at the age of 59. And it was her daughter, Yvonne, who pretty much pretended to be John Clement. And uh, if that were to, were to be the case, then Yvonne would have died at 99 years of age. So she kind of uh, faked being her mother because of like tax reasons and, you know, those kind of things. Now, this theory isn't actually accepted as mainstream theory. The mainstream theory is that, yes, uh, John Clement did actually live until 122 and Yvonne died at around like 35 years of age to some sort of a disease. So it wasn't uh, the Yvonne faking to be her mother. It was actually John Clement living until 122. And we have a lot of like this, um, you know, birth birth data and a lot of these other age verifiers who interviewed John Clement today they uh, came to the conclusion that uh, John Clement was actually the person who lived until 122. And based on this knowledge, then, you know, John Clement does exceed what many scientists think is the human maximum lifespan limit, which would be 120 years. But we don't whether we don't even know if that were to be the actual maximum human lifespan limit, because no one has ever obviously lived longer than John Clement. But, uh, you know, with uh, many theories has that with over the past few decades or the la- you know, next few decades, we're going to have these massive breakthroughs in medicine and technology that are just going to add a bunch of extra years to, you know, of course, those technologies, they're going to increase average life expectancy. That's a trend that is increasing, meaning that people on general are going to live on average longer, but uh, there's no evidence that they would actually break the ceiling of the maximum human lifespan, which is around 120 years. Now, there are also some scientists that use mathematical modeling on mortality rates to see that uh, the human body, you know, it has theoretically the capacity to stay resilient and to wean off this age rate of decline up until the age of like 120 to 150. So they think that the maximum lifespan is like 150. We just haven't reached that uh, yet. And of course, you know, with mathematics, it's you can always put things into the different kinds of formulas and you can use Bayesian analysis, which is another method to like predict future outcomes based on previous uh, knowledge. But you don't necessarily know what's the actual, you know, future, uh, let's say, outcomes are going to be. You can never predict whether or not we are actually at the limit. And those theories would say that it's, you know, they they say that it's like 90% likely that by the year 2100, so in like 80 years from now, there's like a 99% likelihood that uh, we're going to break the 122 year record. But they say that it's virtually impossible, at least within this century, to make it past 135, even if you take into account the steady increase in average life expectancy. So even all these mathematical models that, you know, don't take into account the limitations of human biology and the aging biology, they're just based on mathematical models of the increase in average life expectancy, then even those models 
they see that the maximum that we could reach within this century is 135. Of course, there's also many you know, more, more theoretical, more experimental scientists who are in, in, into like this transhumanism and biohacking and those kind of things. And they say that the longevity escape velocity is going to happen in 2035, which, which means that, you know, every year you stay alive, your life expectancy increases by two years, which means that, you know, you're going to live forever because your your kind of outpacing or like your life expectancy, which is increased due to medical breakthroughs and different kinds of pharmaceuticals, outpaces your speed of biological aging. So you can become immortal or at least you're going to live until hundreds of years. Now, there's no evidence, like zero evidence to indicate that we're anywhere close to this kind of uh, longevity escape velocity. We haven't made any like actual like breakthroughs in this area at all. And we don't even know what to target. Like we don't even know, know what is the thing that is going to enable us to reach this longevity escape velocity. Now, many people think it's AI that's going to help us to reach there. I personally, you know, I mean, it would be nice. <laughs> like I wouldn't be against living uh, or humans living uh, hundreds of years longer than right now, but there's literally no evidence right now that would indicate that we're anywhere close to that. So with that being said, I do think that there is going to be obviously the increase in average life expectancy across the entire world. And uh, in the you know longest living countries right now, like Japan and South Korea, you would see that you know the average life expectancy might increase up to like, 85 and 90 years of age, which means that on average people at birth are expected to live until 90 years of age. Uh, and uh, that's obviously around like 10, 10 years more than right now on average. And, and I think that for us to you know, reach the average life expectancy of like 100, then we still need at least 100 years of uh, science and breakthroughs. But um, again, we don't, you know, we don't know what the future brings. We don't know whether or not we will make any breakthroughs, at least based on right now, you know, given the fact that we're not going to make any massive breakthroughs in anti-aging science based on just the mathematical models, then, you know, the average life expectancy might increase or it will certainly increase. And uh, the maximum lifespan beyond 120, it's possible. It's possible that it will uh, like go above 120 but again those gains are going to be very small you might those gains are going to be like only a few years so I don't think that we're going to reach this everyone's going to live until 150 <laughs> time frame uh, within our lifetime at least this episode is brought to you by Alitura Naturals Alitura brings you the best natural skincare products for radiating skin and anti-aging regular skincare products are full of ingredients and fillers that actually cause more harm than good Alitura uses only active ingredients sourced and handcrafted in Hawaii their products contain zero fillers the Alitura night cream received the 2021 clean cert beauty awards for best face cream. Alitura also has skin moisturizers, clay mask, serums and cleansers. Head over to alitura.com and use the code SIM, S-I-I-M, for a 20% discount. And the next question was actually very similar to this one. So like, how long do you think that I'm going to live? So, uh, you know, okay, let's take a small overview. I'm an Estonian male. Right now I'm 29 years old. And the average life expectancy in Estonia is around 78 or 79. Uh, it's not that great. You know, it's uh, certainly not as good as Japan, which is like 84. Uh, but it's better than a lot of other Eastern European countries and a lot better than Russia or even United States. So I do think that, you know, the average life expectancy in Estonia is going to increase as well. The issue is that in Estonia, there is some you know, issues in regards to healthcare and the average Estonian does consume a lot of alcohol. So I'm by, I'm not by any means an average Estonian. <laughs> I don't drink at all. I have a very healthy lifestyle. I'm in excellent health right now. I'm in excellent body composition right now. I have very good habits and there's, you know, there's nothing at least in my predictable future that would change that like there's no way that I will revert to alcoholism or uh, revert to like a bad diet or I would gain like 50 pounds or you know 20 kilos uh, of body weight <laughs> you know there's little there's very little chance that that would happen so I'm a, I am on a good trajectory in terms of reaching 
at the average life expectancy of Estonians and potentially above that and beyond that as well. So I would I would say that uh, for sure I will reach 80 at least on my current trajectory. But uh, again, you know, I'm 29 years old right now. So in 50 years, we will probably have some breakthroughs in technology. So by that time, if you take into the mathematical model and the trend trend line of the life expectancy increase across the entire world, not just Estonia, then you would say that maybe I would live until 90, 90 something, 95 or something like that. I don't think that I'll be some sort of a super centenarian. I don't have the genetics for that. To become a centenarian and super centenarian, then you need pretty much, you're, you're like, you really need to have very good genes for that. So even like a healthy lifestyle, it's very unlikely that you will reach centenarianhood if you don't have good genetics. So becoming 100 and 120, 115 years old, you need to have good genetics. And I don't have any good genetics in my family. <laughs> like uh, my oldest, like the oldest person in my close family, at least, and, you know, some distant families, uh, you know, the oldest person in there isn't older than 80. So they're all, they have all died before 80 years old. So I don't have any good genetics in that sense. But uh, because of my, you know, very healthy lifestyle and because of my healthy health status right now, which will be maintained for the next decades, for sure, I'm, I'm kind of quite sure of that, then uh, I would say, yeah, my trajectory or my projection projection of how long I personally will live is going to be you know, at least 90 years old, 95, something like that. And of course, if something terrible goes wrong, you know, my grandfather died to colorectal cancer at the age of 36. So if I do have some cancer around my 35 years of age, then, you know, it could all change. <laughs> so the, to prevent that, I have to just take early detection and prevention extremely seriously, which I am. I'm going to, you know, go out of my own way to make sure that uh, I am going to, if I do have some sort of cancer early in my life, then I'm going to detect it as well quite early. And the same applies to heart disease. I have some heart disease in my family as well. So I'm going to make sure that I'm going to detect it early and I'm going to do like, you know, everything in my power just to prevent getting all these chronic diseases. Next question is any merit to tracking morning body temperature for an indicator of thyroid metabolism health? So generally your body temperature does correlate with your thyroid function and your metabolic rate uh, to a pretty large degree. Now, how valuable it is or how relevant it is, I think your, you know, thyroid functioning and your metabolic rate, they only matter to the extent of your metabolic health, your body composition and your overall health status. So what they find in at least the oldest living people in, in the world is that they do have higher levels of TSH, which is thyroid stimulating hormone, which would indicate that they have low thyroid functioning. And there is some reasons to believe that a lower thyroid function could have some longevity benefits because you're burning, let's say, less calories and you're causing less free radical stress on your mitochondria and therefore you age slower. And having like a lower body temperature, at least in some animals, does, you know, it, it, it indicates that or it shows that those animals might live a little bit longer. In humans, obviously, it's a lot more complicated than that because if you get certain kind of metabolic diseases or if you start to gain weight because of your low metabolic rate, then it's counterproductive. So it only matters in the context of are you in good metabolic health and are you in good body composition and how is your like overall health? Because if you have low thyroid function and you are slightly chubby or if you have like a little bit of too much body fat and too you're too heavy and you're ha you have your blood mar markers are also messed up like the things that will rise with low thyroid functioning is going to be cholesterol so if you have low thyroid your cholesterol is going to increase which could be a risk factor for metabolic syndrome and heart disease to a certain extent and if you have low thyroid you're going to gain weight then your insulin sensitivity will also decrease you might get insulin resistance down the line, you might get prediabetes down the line. So in those cases, having the low thyroid is bad because you're going to increase the risk of your metabolic syndrome. So you have to make sure that your final outcome is optimized, which is your body composition and your blood work. So if your blood work is clear, your body composition is also clear, meaning that you're at a relative low body fat percentage, you have good muscle tone, you have good muscle strength and you're in good fitness, then in that case, the low thyroid is probably quite beneficial. So there's no point in 
arbitrarily increasing your thyroid functioning and metabolic rate just because you think it's healthier, for example. And likewise, it's not a good idea to deliberately suppress your thyroid function and deliberately suppress your metabolic rate because it can increase your risk of metabolic syndrome and uh, obesity because of having lower metabolic rate. So it comes down to the final outcome. How is your body composition and blood work? And uh, tracking your, let's say, body temperature, you know, it can tell you some things, like it can certainly tell, you know, aspects of thyroid function, but you also have to correlate it with other symptoms. So if you are losing a lot of weight, you're becoming more frail, you have brittle skin, your hands are cold all the time, you have poor thermoregulation, you get hair loss, you hair thinning, you're tired and fatigued all the time, then that, yes, would mean that you might have like a lower thyroid function and lower metabolic rate. Now, if uh, your body temperature is normal, then everything else is also normal, then of course, you don't need to kind of worry about it at all. But the body temperature, you know, it can also reflect some other things related to your recovery. So if you have somewhat higher body temperature, then it could mean that you are getting sick, for example, you might have caught an infection. If you see that your HRV is also low, your resting heart rate is higher, HRV is lower, your body temperature is also higher, then that probably means that you have caught a cold or some sickness or some infection. Or you might be also overtrained, like overtraining is a pretty big thing that is going to raise your risk of infection and and uh, increase your body temperature as well. So you just, you can, you can, for sure you can use it, but I wouldn't get like too, let's say, worried about it. And I would only, you know, determine if it's valuable based on your other symptoms, like your body composition and biomarkers. So like I said, if you have low body temperature, which would indicate like low thyroid, lower thyroid and lower metabolic rate, then uh, it only matters or it's only dangerous if you also have the other side effects of low thyroid functioning like weight gain and poor biomarkers. But if you have lower body temperature, you have lower re metabolic rate, but your body composition is fine, your biomarkers are also perfect, then that's actually a good thing, at least based on some of the things we know about aging and longevity. So the goal shouldn't be to have super high metabolic rate, the goal shouldn't be to have super low metabolic rate either. The goal is to have optimal body composition and biomarkers and then see, okay, how does the body temperature correlate with those results? Next question, what is an alternative to collagen peptides if you're sensitive to them, like amino acids and eggshell membrane or something like that? So collagen generally, you know, depends on the source, the most collagen is going to be like beef collagen or fish uh, collagen. But there's very little of other types. They're like most of them are going to be beef or fish collagen. You could be allergic to some of those uh, compounds. Like you could be allergic to fish. There's also the potential that uh, the beef could be contaminated with some heavy metals or glyphosate or something like that. So, you know, obviously it depends on the type or the source of what type of collagen are you taking. So first, you know, you can try different brands, some more reputable brands um, that are third party tested for heavy metals and glyphosate and things like that. You can try those. Um, but yes, if it is a case that you really can't take actual collagen peptides because you're very sensitive to them, whatever the symptom might be, gastrointestinal stress, some sort of autoimmune response, inflammatory response, uh, sleep issues or gut issues or whatever, then, you know, the best next best alternative is just beef gelatin powder. And uh, beef gelatin powder is very high in, it has a very similar amino acid profile to collagen peptides. So you can still increase your daily collagen intake with regular gelatin powder. It's, I would consider it more like more hypoallergenic because it generally is just regular <laughs> gelatin powder. But, you know, if you have a beef allergy or something like that, uh, which is very rare, but uh, if you do have a beef allergy, then you still will <laughs> respond or you're, you're going to react to even the beef gelatin powder, uh, not to mention the beef collagen peptides. But yeah, g beef gelatin powder is a good natural food alternative to collagen peptides. Now, the issue with uh, the beef gelatin powder is that we don't have, you know, clinical trials showing that the beef, beef gelatin powder would help with hallmarks of skin aging or reverse markers of skin aging the same way we have uh, with collagen peptides. So the collagen peptides are by now pretty well 
established to have benefits for helping with skin aging and improving skin elasticity and reversing hallmarks of skin aging. We don't have those studies for gelatin. And, uh, you know, it might be that the gelatin is just too large of a molecule compared to low molecular rate collagen peptides. Um, we don't know that yet. <laughs> At least I haven't found any like studies comparing the two or something but uh if any uh, you know at least you're going to increase your daily collagen intake which in turn can help with collagen turnover and maintaining skin health and joint health and those kind of things so i would still increase my gelatin in or like increase my glycine and collagen intake and if you can't take collagen peptides then just take beef gelatin powder for example next question what's something in the research that was considered to be healthy but now turns out it's not. So, you know, the issue I have with food or nutrition research is that it is very subjective and it all depends on the context. You know, argue, you could make the argument that, you know, all food is fine in moderation as long as it doesn't make you gain weight or it doesn't make you become diabetic or it doesn't increase your, let's say, other bad biomarkers like blood pressure or stuff like that you know yes you can make the argument that uh if it if it fits your macros then you can eat anything <laughs> of course over the long term you might not optimize your micronutrient profile you might not optimize your just hormones and other like insulin sensitivity if you eat just junk but you know to a certain point even the unhealthiest foods your body can deal with it if you're in a moderate calorie intake and likewise if you're overeating healthy foods whatever the definition is just whole foods let's say if you eat too much potatoes fruits meats fish eggs if you're in calorie excess especially if you're eating like thousands of more calories above what your body needs then even at that point those healthy and whole foods can have like negative effects on your health so the calorie still matters in that context but uh, i think you know all of these unprocessed foods generally are not that healthy and we do have a lot of you know studies finding that ultra processed food consumption which would be chicken nuggets uh, donuts cookies chocolate i mean like snickers bars and those kind of things uh, and pizzas and uh, other processed foods like ultra processed foods not not things like olive oil or like dairy or something like that which are also processed to a certain extent those ultra processed foods uh, are associated with shorter life expectancy and increased mortality risk you know of course the calorie content is huge in this because if you are just eating burgers and fries then you're going to get a lot more calories than you would get from whole unprocessed foods uh, secondly there are some foods that are also considered to be healthy but uh, m might have some associations with poorer health outcomes and increased mortality one of them being of course sugar sweetened beverages they're not considered healthy but in this category they also put fruit juices and at least like when i grew up fruit juices were considered pretty healthy like orange juice and apple juice and cranberry juice they're considered to be healthy drinks like a healthier alternative to soda but when you look at the research then the sugar sweetened beverages whether that be sodas or juices then they are still associated with increased risk of diabetes and increased mortality. Now, if you eat, if you drink like unprocessed and regular orange juice that you just made yourself, like you just squeeze, you know, three, four, five oranges and you drink that, then, uh, you know, you can still, yeah, within a certain metabolic and like calorie intake, it's still healthy. Of course, if that's like the majority of your diet, then at some point, you will experience some like worsening of your insulin sensitivity and you might gain weight and you might just you know consume too much fructose which uh, can increase like fatty liver and stuff like that even if it's like a whole fruit it's just that you know in a fruit juice concentrate you're getting like let's say a dozen <laughs> oranges if you're drinking like multiple cups per day so it all but it still depends on the calorie intake like even if you are in a very high juice diet but you're in a calorie deficit then yeah i mean in the short term you're gonna not see any negative side effects to your metabolic health but uh i would say that fruit juices at least the ones that you get from the store 
which aren't you know fresh pressed juices those are pretty bad and they used to be considered pretty healthy like my mother thought it was healthy <laughs> i drank some of these uh you know apple juices from the store like in this tetra packages those ones uh they're in most cases they're gonna be just with added sugars and uh not that healthy because they also like have removed the fiber and the other like nutrients from there so it's mostly like just juice concentrated that tastes like juice but it doesn't have actual you know the healthy components of the fruit that you would get from a like a whole pressed uh, juice format secondly i would say that granola is also something that i don't think that is really healthy at least like the children's granola you know <laughs> when i grew up we ate this bland unsweetened just this whole grain muesli and <laughs> that's not the crunchy granola that is sweetened with sugar like the muesli that is just oats some coconut flakes um, a little bit of uh, dried cranberries and no sugar no any other like sweet things just this unflavored muesli <laughs> i think that's probably fine that's healthy in in the in the in the meaning that it doesn't have a bunch of sugar and it doesn't it's not ultra refined carbohydrates it's this whole whole grain oats kind of but uh, the other granola that is uh, this ultra refined grains and uh, added sugar and added chocolate chips and those things then that's i would say certainly unhealthy because yeah refined carbohydrate intake is also associated with increased mortality and increased diabetes so that doesn't necessarily just apply to pastries and donuts but if you know the regular granola is used with uh, ultra like ultra refined grains and it has added sugars then i would say it's equally as bad as a like a donut so if you are eating like muesli or granola then make sure there's like low sugar and uh you know <laughs> the regular muesli that is unflavored then that is kind of the healthiest option i would say but even then you know if you're that's what your only breakfast is like then i would say it's not optimized in terms of the macronutrients like the breakfast ideally you know it could have carbohydrates but uh, the breakfast should still have plenty of protein as well to satiate you and you know help with protein synthesis and stuff like that so you know just having granola or just having muesli for breakfast even if you put milk there is, is not enough protein <laughs> and uh, ideally you would still need some more protein for that so that's why like you know with the with a uh, crump that we made we made our own healthy breakfast granola that is high protein low sugar or doesn't have any added sugar except for a little bit of honey and some dried cranberries uh so it's high fiber high protein and lower carb with no added sugar so that's what i've i would say like we have crunchy granola that has added sugar is bad regular unflavored unsugared <laughs> muesli is generally a bit uh, healthier next question hi c would like to know what workouts is most important fixed to your routine so obviously i've made multiple videos about exercise on my channel i think exercise is the most powerful anti-aging longevity intervention we know it's more powerful than any supplement or drug as of now and uh, exercise will certainly reduce your mortality risk the most out of anything now the thing with exercise is that technically any form of exercise is good any form of exercise will suffice so what you want to do is just you know stimulate the benefits that you get from exercise such as increasing your heart rate in the short term so that you would lower your basal heart rate you would lower your inflammation you would boost your immune system you would strengthen your joints and tendons you would increase your incidence sensitivity you would burn some calories all those things come from any form of exercise whether that be badminton <laughs> whether that be soccer lifting weights running in a park w walking with your dog or playing with your dog whatever all of those movements you know help to achieve those effects at least to a certain extent now there are obviously more effective ways of achieving those effects that's where it comes the idea of doing a structured workout plan that incorporates both resistance training that optimizes for muscle strength bone density and muscle mass and we will have cardiorespiratory activities that focuses on cardiorespiratory fitness heart health and blood vessel health and those kind of things as well which you can achieve with you know any kind of sports soccer tennis all those things are cardiorespiratory activities and you know interval training high intensity interval training sprints cycling what a jogging in the park zone two cardio all those are in that category as well i personally do both obviously i do resistance training and cardio respiratory fitness uh, the research suggests that with um, weightlifting if you want to maximize muscle growth then the kind of upper amount of 
weightlifting workouts per week is going to be around three to four. So if you really want to optimize muscle strength and muscle mass, then three to four workouts per week is the upper limit. And after that, you don't really see additional benefits. Of course, if you're like a professional athlete or a bodybuilder or some sort of you know, who takes some sort of performance enhancing substances, <laughs> then your recovery is faster and you can work out more often as well. But the average person generally, the recommended amount, the maximum recommended amount is three to four per week. I personally work out with weights three times per week because when you look at you know the maximum benefits then the benefits for, from high intensity and resistance type activities they peak at around like 150 to 200 minutes per week so you don't need to do more to get the biggest reduction in your mortality risk and cardiovascular disease risk so you I, I personally don't see the reason to do more than that so I don't really work out any more than 200 minutes per week with weights and usually my workouts per session are like 45 minutes so I actually have pretty short uh, resistance training sessions because that's what already optimizes and that's what is giving you the maximum benefits for risk reduction from resistance training you could do more but then you have to be really careful with recovery and actually make sure that you are you know recovering and not overtraining. so there's no additional benefits from the longevity perspective from overtraining. You might get additional weight loss benefits from overtraining or you might build more muscle and more strength by training more often. But from a longevity perspective, then you don't need to train any more than three times per week and 45 minutes per session. That's what I do. And uh, with in regards to cardio workouts, then the threshold or the maximum upper limit for benefits for cardio is actually a lot higher. So when you look at how much moderate vigorous activity you could do, then you can still see benefits even if you go from 200 minutes up until 800 minutes and 900 minutes. So theoretically, you could do even 900 minutes of moderate physical activity per week and still keep getting benefits in terms of lowering your risk of all-cause mortality and lowering risk of cardiorespiratory uh, or cardiovascular disease. So I think it's much more important to focus on getting more of the moderate physical activity because you get the maximum benefits from resistance training even within 150 to 200 minutes per week so you don't need to do more than that but if you miss out on the moderate physical activity which includes zone to cardio hiking walking your dog you know doing something that is more than just regular walking and sitting down but it's not as intense as lifting weights or doing interval cardio then you're going to get more benefits by doing more of the moderate physical activity. And that's what I've been shifting more towards over the past year or so. I'm doing significantly less resistance training. I'm still at pretty advanced levels with my muscle mass and muscle strength. And uh, I'm doing a lot more of the moderate physical activity. So I'm walking more, I'm rocking, I'm hiking, I'm doing more zone two cardio, and uh, I'm getting at least 600 minutes per week of moderate physical activity, which includes, yeah, like different kinds of, uh, you know, they're not super strenuous physical activities. So like, yeah, uh, brisk walking, hiking, and uh, cycling, zone two cardio. So on average, I'll aim for around two to three zone two cardio sessions per week for 45 to 55 minutes. So I don't really ever like work out longer than 60 minutes because uh because i'm working out pretty much every day so i don't need to have super long workout sessions and it could actually be more counterproductive to work out over an hour if you're working out every day because you're going to tap into your recovery and that can actually just you know cause some increased risk of respiratory tract infections and um, other you know poor health outcomes if you're just over training so i don't want to overtrain. i do want to maximize the 150 to 200 minutes of resistance training per week, which I will achieve with three 45 minute workouts per week, alternating between upper body, lower body, and those kind of things. And I do want to maximize that I get at least like 600 to 800 minutes of moderate physical activity per week. So I guess <laughs> that's that's my answer to the question. It's obviously pretty you know precise, <laughs> but uh, I would say that you know workout like the simpler answer would be workout with weights three times per week. You don't need to do more than that. Uh, you could, but it doesn't give you additional longevity benefits. And instead, do at least you know two to three cardio sessions as well per week. But if you do cardio, then don't make it too intense. Because if you start to do zone three, four, five cardio, then that is already categorized as 
this vigorous physical activity instead of moderate physical activity. So if you are doing cardio, then the zone two cardio is the way to go. So zone two is around 60 to 70% of your maximum heart rate. So you can subtract your age from 220, you're gonna get your maximum uh, heart rate and the 60, 60 to 70% of that is your zone two. So you do that for 45 minutes per uh, session and ideally do like, you know, at maximum, I think three zone two cardio sessions per week is kind of the upper limit but one at least, <laughs> I try to do like two to three uh, per week. Next question, can I feel like my 20s even well into my 50s and 60s? It's hard to define how do you feel like you're in your 20s. Do you look at aspects of body composition? Do you look at aspects of muscle strength? Other types of fitness, your VO2 max? You know, there's certainly things that do decline with age. By default, your muscle strength, muscle mass, testosterone, and your VO2 max decline around 10% per decade, roughly, roughly speaking. So it's hard to be precisely like in your 20s, in your 50s and 60s, because there is gonna be some decline. Now they do find that the individuals who maintain a physically active lifestyle, they, they can function up to, up to like 30 dec uh, three decades younger than their peers. So in one particular study, they looked at 80 year olds and the 80 year olds who had the highest fitness, highest muscle strength and VO2 max, then they were functionally as fit as the 50 year olds who didn't exercise. <laughs> no, that's not a really high standard, but I would say that if you're 80 years old and you can function like a 50 year old, then that's still a huge win because at 50 years old, you're still pretty independent. You can still do pretty much everything that you want. You can still walk around, you can take the stairs, you can lift stuff, you can play with your dog or grandchildren, whatever. So at 50 years old, being able to, you know, or at 80 years old, being able to do the things that a 50 year old would, even if they're not like super fit, then that's still a huge win because the 80 year olds that don't have that good strength and fitness, they're like falling off the cliff pretty hard. <laughs> like at 80, you know, my grand grandmother is 75 years old. She has had poor health all her life. Recently, I saw her, she has lost a lot of weight. She's very skinny and, um, you know, she kind of needs a cane to walk around and she's not even 80, she's 75 years old. So, and she, because, and that's the reason is because of her, she has had some health issues pretty much all her life and she obviously has never like exercised regularly. But if you're 80 years old and you are fit and you're functionally as fit as a 50 year old, then that's pretty huge win. And that's why obviously what you want to strive towards to maintain this better health and better functional uh, fitness and functional freedom up until you're 80 and 90 years old uh, even. So there's even like this 90 year old uh, gymnasts <laughs> who are able to do some very basic and simple gymnastic tricks, which, you know, <laughs> is pretty profound when you think about how much, you know, it's just you know, gymnastics is very complex or it's very taxing on the body in terms of the joints and impacts and those kind of things. So yeah, if you are able to do gymnastics when you're 90 years old, even if it's, if it's like a simple cartwheel or uh, you know, you're rolling around or stuff like that, then that's a huge win. In your 50s and 60s, it's very possible to be as fit and healthy as a 30 year old or a 20 year old even, because the average 20 or 30 year old, they're not super healthy. But if you are maintaining better, let's say fitness, muscle strength, VO2 max, bone density and body composition, you don't wanna be overweight, then yes, you can act and feel like a 20 year old. I'm pretty sure of that. And we have research showing that at least 30 years, you can be at least 30 years uh, younger in terms of your uh, physical fitness compared to your peers. And that's the last question of the Q&A. If you want to ask me a question in the future, then make sure you follow me on Instagram at Seamlund. And I'm gonna do those Q&As quite regularly there. But do you want to achieve and maintain biological youth? If yes, then I'm looking for more people who want to add healthy years to their life. If you're interested, then email me the word health to info at and I'll send you the details. But other than that, thanks for watching this video. Make sure you click a like, subscribe, notification bell as well. My name is Seem. Stay optimized, stay empowered.